Jesus said, if you have a Bible with you, I'd like to go to the Gospel of John chapter 4. I'm going to be reading from verse 34 through 38. It's the Gospel of John chapter 4. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you for us being able, Father, to go through your word and listen and hear and receive. I pray that even more so we apply and operate according to it. Give us the strength and the ability and the power and give us the mind. Because without the heart and the mind, we'll never do anything for God. And we thank you in the name of Jesus this morning for your word. Amen. My message this morning is harvest. And this passage of Scripture, of course, if, you, if you've been uh, studying the Word of God very long, you know that the main issue here is this Samaritan woman. And the Samaritan woman comes to him when he's at the well, and he asks her to get him a drink. And, of course, she's like, like why? You know, this guy's a Jewish guy. He's asked me to get him a drink. This is weird, right? So he gets the guy. She gives him a drink, and he tells her, if you'd asked me, I'd give you living water. And uh, so you wouldn't, you, that would flow forever lasting, you know. And she's like, uh, oh, because oh, she, she didn't like coming to the well and drawing. And I uh, heard a lot of theories on that. We won't go there today. But uh, so he ministers to her for a while, and back come the disciples. And they're like, what? He's a Jewish guy. You know, they had the same reaction that, that, that the woman did, you know. Oh, why is he talking to her? This ain't, you know, this is weird. They would say, well, this is not normal right here. I mean, you know, Jesus will speak to about anybody. So should we. Amen. Doesn't matter if they're outcasts. Doesn't matter if they've had five spouses. It doesn't matter about their past. It's their future that we want to speak into and see changed. Amen. So, so Jesus... You know, the, he, he's, he's like, uh, uh, they told him to eat, and he tells them, I have food you don't know not, you don't even know about. And they're like, did somebody give him food? Did somebody, because they was out getting food, you know. They, went, they made a run to Mickey D's, and they come back, and he's already, he's acting like he's done had, you know, fries. Hallelujah. So the disciples, you know, they're like, wow. And so he, he, you know, he always knows what's going on with them, and he always addresses it. So he just basically says, my food is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. And what are we supposed to do? The will of him who sends us and to finish his work, each and every one of us having a gifting and a calling. And then he says, you all say it's going to be four months to harvest, but I tell you right now it's to harvest. And here's a very common mistake that I see and that we're going to address and look at in some other passages as well. But for some reason, the harvest is there. We just don't see it. We come across people all the time that God would like to see us sow seed into or to even reap the harvest because others have already labored there. And we have the opportunities left and right, but most of the time we're not even thinking about it. We're not thinking about harvest. Most of us do not harvest. I noticed that Cheryl and I, uh, Pastor Cheryl and I went with the kids. We went down to my brother's for uh, Thanksgiving, and there was countless people on Thanksgiving in the fields, harvesting. They were, I mean, I don't know if you all saw them, but there was combines, there was corn pickers, they were everywhere. Because a lot of guys nowadays, they're not huge farmers, they're smaller farmers, and most of them work factory jobs. Honestly, a lot of them work other jobs and things. They drive school buses, they work factory jobs. So when they get a chance to do something, even on a holiday, when we're supposed to be giving thanks to God, they're out working. And they got to get that in because you can't leave it out there too long. So they got to get it in. You know, they have a short window, and the wind the, it wasn't raining, and, and they were working to beat the band. Dust was everywhere from that stuff. We're supposed to be the same way. We're supposed to be working the harvest. We're supposed to be seeing that the harvest is there. 
And we have to understand that uh, just because I sow a seed, it doesn't mean that I'm going to be the one who's going to reap. Amen? The Apostle Paul deals with this as well. You know, he talks about Apollos and himself and different ones baptized people and did different things, but we all receive the increase. I mean, God's the one who gives the increase. God's the one who brings forth the fruit and causes people to get saved. But the harvest is there. And I believe, you know, that God's prepared a harvest for this church if the corn pickers will get busy. Amen? Now, some of you are pea pickers, I know. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, that's a little bit different. But, hey, what the heck? We don't care what you're picking as long as you're picking. Anything except your nose. Okay, come on. I thought somebody would go smart off and say that. <laughs> uh, my dad said I was digging for Brown County gold. I don't know what that was. I was going to poke my eye out from the inside. I... But there's a harvest waiting. You know, when, when we first started talking about coming up here to this church and moving and locating up here, and uh, before we had started Versailles back up or anything, even though that was always in our heart when we came up here, we'd always had that plan to do that. Uh, we got a word. I got a word from some pastor in a totally other town that I hadn't seen for a couple of years or longer, and he gave a word to Danny for me. And that word says Batesville and Oldenburg. Go there and drill. I prepared a harvest for you in Batesville. And I think we've been drilling. Now, we've been up here, believe it or not, nine years. I know it's hard to believe, but we came up in 2008, and next year will be our 10-year anniversary, and we'll play that up somehow, you know, anytime you can get your number or name in the paper. But it's hard to believe it's been that long, but it has been. And we started Varsales back up in 2012, so it's been going back for, for you know, uh, half a dozen years almost. We uh, were very blessed, and we've been very blessed but we haven't seen that harvest yet, have we? Now, there's been outpourings, and we've had presence of God here and strong presence of the Spirit. So I don't know if we're drilling. You know, when I first heard that word, you know, drilling to me, I'm thinking oil, but then I'm thinking, you know. How many know that you can drill and drill with oil and not necessarily hit anything, but when you do, you get a gusher? Amen. Now, we could be drilling for water. Now, I had a cousin, and... Uh, one of, one of uh, her uncles, and he was actually my cousin too. <laughs> my dad married my dad uh, my dad married my, my let's see my, my dad's cousin married my mom's sister. So I have cousins that are double cousins. It's not as bad as the Burford clans, you know, as Jeremy David's family, trying to figure out them and Jason and all, but uh, almost you know what I'm talking about, don't you Sue? Yeah, she knows. You can't keep that straight. You have to have more fingers than what you've got to be able to work that one out. You know how you have the family tree? Theirs is more like a bonsai. You know, it's one of them. Oh, well, anyway, she used to, this cousin of mine used to witch wells. She'd go out with some fork and stick or something. She'd go out and, 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 and have people drill. I mean, well, witching's not in the Bible. I don't think it's a good thing. Uh, it's considered a divination in a way. Uh, is there any scientific reason why it ought to work. I don't know that they've ever proven that there is. And uh, I know she got sued and got out of the business because somebody drilled a big hole and they didn't get anything. So uh, it didn't work every time. We're here to drill. Now, hitting water sounds more like things of the spirit, but we could do both. But we're here for a harvest and the harvest is out there. We just got to see that the harvest is out there. We had several words come forth when we were in the, in the prayer room today, and I encourage you to come out. We meet at quarter after uh, 9 normally. Next week will be quarter after 10. But there were several words that came forth, and, and uh, one of the people had had a dream, had been dreaming that this church is going to explode and we're going to have to take walls down. And, and somebody else that had a word that was... Uh, basically encouraging us to do what we were praying, which we were praying over some of these scriptures about the harvest and going forth and seeing that the harvest would happen. And I think that that's something that we really need to be mindful of. God has called us to let our light shine through your crack pots. Hallelujah. 
This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I sang that when I was in vacation Bible school as a child. I went to a church when they had vacation Bible school. We didn't go a whole lot otherwise, but I did, and I made an ashtray. So so they looked at me a little funny, but anyway, oh, yeah. It must have been before my dad quit smoking because he quit smoking pretty young. All right, four months to the harvest. Why do we put time constraints on what God can do? Why do we limit what God can do? Sometimes we're talking to someone, we're thinking they ain't going to get it. How do we know they aren't going to get it? You placed a seed in them, and we prayed like Isaiah talked, that God's word would not return void, amen? So when we place that seed, we've got to believe that that seed is going to bring forth fruit. And even if they receive the seed and say they received a seed and say a prayer, sometimes we think, wow, they may have asked Jesus to be their Savior, but they still ain't got it. They aren't progressing very well or very far or anything, and we judge them on that. And uh, I know I went down to an altar when I was 14 years old. I was baptized by immersion. I answered all that, and I, I fell away as quickly as I was. I, I probably, my hair probably wasn't even wet. Or it was probably still wet when I fell away. And uh, it was another 14 years before I came back. But that seed of Christ was always there. I believe that. You know, I I had a certain respect for God and for the things of God, even though I didn't think most of my behavior had anything to do with that. I just had no understanding. I was ignorant, which means without, without knowledge, and I was definitely that. But every day is harvest day. Every day is harvest day. Amen? Every day. Now, Mark chapter 11, we're going to read some more. Mark chapter 11, and we're going to go to verse number 12 through 14. And this is Jesus, and he's traveling with his disciples. And it says, Now the next day, when they had come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar off a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Now, whoa. Here's a fig tree. It wasn't even time for the fig tree to have figs. But Jesus still was a little upset that there was no fruit on that tree. You see, Jesus has a right to expect impossible fruit. We make excuses for our lack of fruit and for why we're not sowing seed and why we're not letting our light shine, but Jesus has expectations. Amen? I don't want my faith to wither, my prayer life, or my walk with God to wither because I, I'm not doing and producing like God would want me to. If we go on down, he explains this to them in, in chapter 11, verse number 20. And we'll read through 24. It says, Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look! The fig tree which you cursed has withered away. I mean, it's mind-blowing. You know, it's like just like the next day they come by and that tree is dead. And he says, And so Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Now there's a lot of keys in here. I was... You know, when I first started going to church, this was probably one of the scriptures that, that hit me the most at the time because I had no idea that, one, that you could talk to God about stuff. Now, I mean, you know, I prayed to God, you know, oh, Lord, let that girl like me, oh, you know. He never answered that one, thank God, because, uh, you know, he was, he was uh, waiting for me to have the right one to come by. I prayed for her, too, but I, I was praying a little differently than I did back in those days. Back in those days, I was praying to consume it upon my lust, to be honest with you. And uh, he didn't answer that prayer. But when I got older, I was praying for someone who could do what she does, amen, which is put up with me 
And I uh, thought I'd get a lot of amens on that. But uh, be with me in ministry, which she has been and does and is. Hallelujah. But Jesus told them, have faith in God. Basically, confidence, trust, belief, reliance, persuasion. That's what that means. We're supposed to have trust in God. Now, when we think about he's, his example that he used was a tree that was not bearing any fruit. I noticed that nobody turned around and spoke life back into that tree. Hmm. In another place, he doesn't use the word mountain. He says a sycamine tree be cast into the sea. Amen. Nobody commanded the tree to be gone either. The testimony to no fruit was still there. But he's teaching them a different lesson, and it has to do with faith. And it has to do with speaking to mountains. And the word came forth this morning while we were talking about this that we have a tendency that even if we see the harvest, our focus isn't on the harvest, it's on the mountains. Because we get taken up with all the little problems and all the things, you know. We make mountains out of molehills and things that we shouldn't even be concerned about, we get concerned about. And we allow them to, to, to draw on us and stress us and, and cause us to walk in fear and doubt and different things. Because we're looking at the wrong thing. If we look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, amen, then we'll walk in faith because we can trust him. How many know you can trust Jesus? You trusted him with your soul, didn't you? If you've asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, you have trusted him with your soul. You've trusted him with your eternity. Why not trust him with the next paycheck? Or why not trust him with the seed you're going to plant in somebody else's life, the harvest that you want to bring forth? Amen? Why not trust him with that? Why not trust him to watch out over and protect your kids? Sometimes it's hard when they're growing up and they write Sandy. Anyway, uh, hallelujah. No, it's hard. It's, sometimes it's hard because you think, man, I want to live my, I want to live their life for them. And you can't live their life. They got to live their life. They learn their lessons. They get their cracks in their pots. But eventually what we pray is that the light's going to shine. And I really believe that the whole prodigal son story is a story that many here could share because I know a lot of you have had kids that kind of went away. Fourteen years, I wasn't serving God, but I came back, amen? In fact, I might have been the only one at the time that was probably serving God in my family. But, praise God, they, uh, they all are now, amen? Well, more or less, have at one time or other. Close to it, anyway. Okay, it's a process. We heard it was a process. Hallelujah. Amen. There was another word that came forth this morning. We had a lot of prophetic things come forth in the, in the prayer room this morning. Another one had to do with the, uh, with, with the, uh, the giants in the land and the, uh, the spies who went into the land seeing themselves as grasshoppers in their sight. It's another of making the problem bigger than you are. The issue with it is, is you make the problem bigger than God. Because a lot of problems are bigger than you are. A lot of your problems are not going to be solved through your own flesh and blood and through your own working on it and your own stressing out about it and worrying about it overnight and thinking about it and, and uh, recounting and recounting and all that, shuffling. It does, a lot of that doesn't going to help, help anything. Only Jesus can solve a lot of your problems, but he's able to do it unless we make the problems bigger than him. We elevate them. And I like what was said this morning that, They'd already been told to go possess the land, but instead they went to spy it. Why didn't they just go possess it? Hmm. Anyway, it's a good thought, isn't it? I've got to look at that a little more. I don't want to look at that. But it says here that if you will speak to the mountain. I like what this says. You know, I was, I was uh, started out with a, more of a word of faith background. And uh, part of me is not giving up on that because death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. And you're either speaking forth death or you're speaking forth life. And when you look at your checkbook, you can do like Norval Hayes and laugh at it when it looks like it's going bankrupt. Or you can cry about it. And he stood in faith and laughed at it and said, Ha, 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 you are a liar. My God is true. 
I'm not going to go bankrupt. He'd been, he'd been embezzled by one, by one employee that stole his money. Another one was stealing the ra- restaurant equi- equipment right out of his restaurant. It was a different business. <laughs> I mean, he had things happening left and right. Kenneth Hagin told him that God was going to take care of it, so Norval just believed him and prayed and believed it. And I tell you what, sometimes that's what we have to do. Say unto the mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and whatever you say, you're going to have. And I always like the way that they pointed out the fact of how much saying was going on here. I say to you, whoever says, but he who believes all things, he says, he will have whatever he says. What's the testimony of your, the, of your mouth? What's the fruit of your lips? What do you speak forth? I don't think they're ever going to get saved. We say stuff like that, don't we? I don't think they're ever going to straighten up. Well, they've had plenty of chances. If they was going to do it, they'd have done it by now. That's not the right testimony, amen? We've got to believe that God's seed's going to bring forth the right fruit in people, regardless of who they are, where they are, what they've done where they're coming from, God can do it. And it doesn't matter whether they're older than you, younger than you. It could be your parents instead of your children. It doesn't matter. Whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. He who doesn't doubt in his heart, he who believes, you're going to get it. Why don't we pray for fruit? Amen. This morning, we repented in the prayer room because we felt like we should because we weren't working the harvest and doing what we should and what we knew to do. We're going to do that again before we leave here today. But I want to move on to one more passage of Scripture here for a purpose, and that is verses 25 and 26 because it went right with this. It says, And when you, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. We're supposed to forgive people. Now, we know that for unforgiveness hinders our prayers. We've heard messages on it. We know that when we don't forgive people, we just hurt ourselves. We stop up the answer to prayer. It doesn't matter how much you speak stuff, but if you're holding against other people. And I think about this, and I think, you know, Jesus was God's seed sown into this world. God let him be sown into the world so that you and I could have salvation, so that we could receive forgiveness for our sins through the blood of Christ. If he's sown that, he expects to reap that from us. We should flow in forgiveness. If you're reading through the Bible, you're probably in 1 John, and you're probably reading about love, 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 love. You don't have the love of God in you if you don't love. You're not a person of love if you don't have love. You want your prayers answered? Forgive. Now, I agree that there's a difference between forgiving and forgetting, and sometimes the forgetting's hard. But if you don't deal on the forgetting also, you just go back into unforgiveness. So there comes a place of healing that you have to seek. Allowing God to do something with that crack in your pot so that you can be mended and whole and walk in wholeness and forgiveness towards everyone. And I know how that is. I, I, I was upset at a guy one time, and every time the guy's name came up, you know, I choose to forgive him. I choose. But I didn't choose to like the guy at all. Not at all. And then I used excuses for my unforgiveness. I'd say, well, I'm not worried about, you know, I, it's okay between us. I just don't want to see him do what he did to other people. You know, I don't want to see him do that to somebody else. So I dealt with that. I mean, you know, that's the wrong attitude. I wasn't really forgiving. I was hindering my prayers. But God showed me, just like he's showing some of you. You have to deal with it. You have to forgive. It's not a question of whether you should or not. I think you know you should. But the sowing and reaping principle exists here too. If you don't sow forgiveness, you're not going to reap forgiveness. That's what it says. So you have to forgive. 
Now, in Amos chapter 9, verse 13, we won't turn there, but it's on the screen. It says, Behold. Oh. I might have wrote down the wrong scripture. I said I must have wrote down 9.3. I've, I've got it written here, so I'll just read it. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. The mountain shall drip with sweet wine. We're, uh, I think we're coming to a day and a time where the harvest is going to explode, not just here, but uh, around the world. There's got to be an end time harvest. I believe that. And I believe with this harvest that's coming, there's going to have to be people who are ready to work the fields, and that's us. But this harvest will actually overtake us. The influx, the people getting saved, all that's going to be so great. And it's happening in other parts of the world. It is. Certain parts of, of the world is having an explosion. South America, Africa, and China especially. Europe, not so much, but we got people there sowing seed. And they're believing for fires to be lit again in people's hearts over there. Amen? Uh, we have a number of stadiums in the United States that would be great for revival. Because if we get a big enough harvest, you ain't going to have enough room for people in churches. Amen? We can't even get 200 people in here. Think about that. Wait till the holiday dinner next week. See how many people we can pack into that fellowship hall. Amen? We got both churches together. It's going to be a good time. It'll be a good time of fellowship. But I can tell you now, there are people out there you're going to see this week that ought to be here eating with us. And even if you're not an evangelist, so to speak, and you don't feel real comfortable with saying a lot of scriptures and and, uh, trying to get people saved, and, you know, I I went out when I was young and passed out tracts. I stood on street corners. I I went out with a group of guys one time down in Louisville, and uh, it was called Evangelism Expansion, and it was kind of a a take on, on Evangelism Explosion, which I'm sure some of you have taken that course. In fact, we even did it years ago at our church. But, uh, and we were out we were out somewhere, and we stood in the parking lot holding hands, praying, and I thought, dear God, I have really went along. Boy, I'm holding hands with a man. And, uh, you know, it was just like, what the heck? <laughs> and we were several of us there. And we, we were in a parking lot, and there was a bar over here, and there was another something over here and over there. So we went towards the bar, and this guy came out of the bar, and I said, oh, you know, I was kind of goofy. Uh, well, you knew that anyway, didn't you? <laughs> anyway, I said, uh, hey, uh, have you ever thought about asking Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? And he stopped me and said, yeah, I have. <laughs> what? <laughs> the first guy I walked up to, God did that for me, I think, to show me something. There's people out there who are ready. I didn't, I'd never talked to that guy. You know, he told me, he said, yeah, I've been watching some stuff on television. I think I So I talked to him a little bit, and we led him in a sinner's prayer. Hallelujah. I met a guy in Cleveland, Tennessee. We used to go around and do outreaches and different things down there, and we were doing door-to-door stuff. And I met this young man out there, and I said, you know, I, one of my lines I like to use was, hey, you know, I'd say something like, how's a good Lord treating you today? And most people answered that when we were there, and I'd say, oh, so you know the Lord, do you? You know, that's my, that's my way in. Or I'd say something, hey there, you probably, uh, you probably heard of Jesus, haven't you? And usually they say something like, yeah. And I'll say, have you ever asked him to be your Lord and Savior? You know, so I asked this one guy that. I said, hey, you've heard of Jesus, haven't you? He goes, no, I don't think so. I mean, he had no clue. He was from Cleveland, Tennessee. There's a church on every corner, which taught me something else. There's people out there who haven't heard. They say, actually, it takes the five or six times of hearing the gospel for somebody to actually respond to it. So hearing it once from me may not be enough. Maybe they need to hear it from you. Next week, we're having our Christmas program. It's going to be a children's program. It's not going to be a real long thing, and then I'm going to have follow it up with a to-the-point, you need Jesus in your life, he came here for you kind of a thing, which can address any unsaved people that are here. Now, whether they answer the altar call or not, it doesn't matter. They get to hear the word of God. Then we have that time of fellowship where they get to know some of us. If you and your clan don't hog them and say, you know, if you share them with some other people, 
you know how we have to do that. Amen. Uh, I always encourage people to, you know, spouses can sit together, but I mean, your whole, you know, extended family and everybody, you know, make a little room for, for some other weirdos besides just the ones you're related to. Oh yeah. (laughs) Those double cousins and all them people, you know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah. Amen. I think there's a harvest. Whether we're blind to it and we don't look for it, whether we just don't step into it and we don't do it, whether we allow the mountains to stop it, I don't want to be a cursed dead fig tree. I want to produce fruit. Amen. I would like somebody who has some worshiping abilities to come to the altar and play something. And I see Joanna's looking at Carla. So it must be, she must be the real praiser, I guess. That's, that's, I would take that as high praise on your praising abilities. Hallelujah. Just play something we won't have to sing necessarily. But what we are going to do is what we did in the prayer room today so that everybody can get on the same page. We're going to repent. You can stand. You can kneel. You can come to the altar. But if you know you've not been sowing seed the way you should, if you know that you, do, you don't even think about the harvest most of the time, you don't even think about other things and other people, you just live in your life going from one, one point to the next, then you need to consider that the God of all heaven and earth wants to use you to touch people's lives. He wants to use you to minister. He wants to use you. Now think about that. You. You can say, well, I'm kind of old and I don't know anybody and I don't know. Well, I bet you go into bank once in a while and there's a girl behind that counter that you could say something to. I bet you probably buy, buy gas at the gas station. I know we can stand outside and just punch stuff in. We don't have to talk to anybody, but sometimes we talk to people. Just be mindful of the fact there are souls in the balance. There are people out there who are going to go to hell because somebody like us didn't do what we were supposed to because we didn't tell them. We didn't speak to them. Go ahead and stand your feet. And you can kneel, you can bow, whatever, but I'm just getting everybody to move a little bit. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every person in this room today. I thank you, Lord God, that you called us to bear fruit. And I believe, Lord, if we are a people who are about your business, we will bear fruit. So I ask that you would help us on several areas. First off, help us to see the, the harvest that's there. Help us to be mindful of us and forgive us for having blind eyes. Forgive us for being self-concerned and on our own timetables and, and not, not looking at what we should be looking at. Help us, Lord, to overcome that. And Lord, I know it has to be overcome because... We can say in a service like this that we're going to do something different and then we go out of here and we don't do anything, maybe for a couple of days. Help us become a lifestyle with us that we would see the harvest. And then help us be laborers in that harvest. The whites, the fields are white. Help us to labor in those harvests, Lord. Help us to spread the word and sow the seed. Let us not be a fig tree that produces no fruit. We know you expect fruit. And we thank you that we'll not be concerned about the seasons because every day is harvest day and that we will sow seed left and right. I pray we sow it on good ground that brings forth much fruit. But I pray we sow it on the other ground as well because we don't know what ground it is. We can't judge that. So I thank you that we'll sow seed into the hearts of men and women and children that lives will be changed. And I thank you, Lord, that if there's circumstances that we need to see removed in their lives, that we'll speak to the mountains, that they'd be gone. That we'd speak to those things that stop the plow from going through the hard ground, and we command it to be broken up and follow so that seed can be sown. That we'd be faithful, Lord, in our prayer life to pray for those people that we know we're to pray for. And I thank you, Lord, that we will see a harvest individually and as a corporate body as a church we'll see people answer altar calls we'll see people get saved because you lord god want that to happen and we praise you and thank you for it father we give you the glory lord we thank you that your awesome goodness lord will 
shine through us. That, Lord, that light would shine even through our broken places that draws other people to you. Hallelujah. We thank you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Forgive us, Lord. Amen.